Welcome to Vox Stream, a Kill Team podcast where we aim to help players of all skill levels supercharge their game and separate the signal from the noise. I'm Mark Meyer, joined by Kill Team heavyweights George Pratt and Joe Gallo. We're coming to you from the Triangle region in North Carolina. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. All right, welcome back to Vox Stream, everyone. We have another awesome episode lined up for y'all. But first, want to welcome in uh, co-hosts George and Joe. What's going on, guys? What's up? What's up? It's a uh, Friday, not to date the podcast, but uh, I'm tired because I worked all week. I'm doing great. Waiting to hear back on a job. But other than that, I start another job on Monday, so I'm feeling feeling great. That's good. I, you know, after a while, fun employment becomes a little less fun. I know, and it's like super open employment. I can work whenever I want, so that's a peace of mind I didn't know existed. Let's talk about a little kill team. Uh, I don't think we have a lot to get into as far as a preamble, so I think we're going to run right into some league game recaps from this past week. Again, George said we're recording on Friday, but on Tuesday and thereabouts, we played our league games for this past week at Atomic Empire in Durham. The... Game type was Into the Dark, the mission was Capture, and the map was number four, Bridge. And just real quick, is that the least liked ITD map? It's certainly my least liked ITD map. No, it is the second second most disliked ITD map next to the... Corridor. Yeah, the Elite Killer (laughs) Corridor. I don't remember that one. I gotta look it up. Corridor is awful. Corridor is the one where it's three um, like hallways where the two on each side, the left and right side, are blocked off by a door wall. And the only way to get to the center room is to start deploy your models in the center hallway or deploy them, uh, move them from the left and right side to a door that is like up by the wall in the midboard. Which one did you say that one was again? Oh, I'm sorry. Channels. Now, bear in mind that that the Into the Dark maps, for the most part, are pretty solid. But I will say those two particular maps encourage people to have um, what what the, what do you call it? Uh, the the non-aligned maps that you did, George, for the triangle open. Oh, the uh, LVO asymmetrical yeah, ITD maps. That's, that's encouraged pe- the community to, to crowdsource different types of maps, um, since those two are particularly awful. And um, I like the idea of the community coming together to create different map types. Yeah, I remember seeing those boards at the Triangle Open and thought that they looked like a lot of fun to play on. Or certainly to try out, at least. Some of them were. Others of them I'm not a fan of, but as that goes with anything. Yeah, I like them all. I Unfortunately, since I was running the tournament, I still haven't played on any of those asymmetric ITD maps, which makes me a sad, sad boy. Yeah, you've kind of, like, screwed yourself out of playing anything locally from here until the end of time, unless Mark steps up, yeah? Well, at least someone steps up. Yeah, I mean, that certainly might be me, might be Mark, who knows? Listen, I won't say no. <laughs> Anyways, uh, Mark, are you going to start with yours? Uh, I actually think I want to start with George, because we talked a little bit on the last program about how George got absolutely demolished in his last league game, and I know he's itching to talk about it. So, George, do you want to tell us about uh, the ass-kicking? Get your popcorn, yes. kids. This is going to be a good one. Let me divulge my shame. Uh, so I played against Nick Shepard, who won our last tournament on Nemesis Claw. Uh, he's a very good player. He's playing Vet Guard for the league, trying to get his uh, Vet Guard Revenge Tour going. I went into that relatively confident. Uh, it was my first ever Into the Dark game as Brood Bros. And I was like, uh, it's like Vet Guard. They probably play pretty similarly. I took the Primus and the uh, Lookout as my assets. I took the the Knife Guy instead of the Medic. I took the Sniper, uh, and Plasma, and Grenade Launcher. And the game basically went turn one, nothing happened. Turn two, I lose my Veteran and Primus to a Demo Mine first thing. And that was pretty much it. My sniper didn't kill anything in shooting. Like, it was a tough game. It was a close game. And then his guardsman refused to die. Like, when is a a sniper hitting on twos fire at everyone and only leave them on one wound consistently? 
against five up save, seven wounds. How does that happen? I mean, that sounds like vet card. They do just refuse to die. That's their whole thing. <laughs> it was brutal. The only time my sniper killed anyone was in melee. <laughs> what is the um? Is the Primus or the sniper? Is it three three mortal wounds three hitting on twos? Yep, it is the vet guard sniper, except it cannot go on engage. So it's a good sniper, but man, he just he kept rolling those fives and sixes on saves. Uh, the plasma gun. So I learned a number of things in that game. One, I criminally. Oh, uh, underestimated the demo mine, even though I played Vet Guard and know how powerful it is. I criminally overestimated how useful the Primus's initiative ability would be. Uh, and I also took just the wrong models on Into the Dark against Vet Guard. Uh, I should have dropped the Plasma Gun. I should have taken the Flamer. Uh, I should have either taken the Patriarch or Familiars, Interference, and Lookout. That's what I should have done. And if I had done those things, it would have been a very, very different game. See, that's one of the things I like about Brood Brothers, like as opposed to like Vetguard. They have so many like interesting points of choice at the very beginning of the game. And as you surmise, it becomes very, very important to pick the right models. Like one of the big things people complain about in Kill Team this edition versus the old edition uh, is lack of like list building and stuff like that. And I think teams like that teams like inquisition kind of scratch that itch for a lot of people. Uh, I do find it interesting that that's where you found the fault in your star, so to speak of like what, like as opposed to like Nick, right? You maybe have two or three flex spots for vet guard. Other than that, you're picking pretty much the same models every time. Um, so it's interesting at what point, if, uh, uh, Geller Pox is another example of that, right? Geller Pox has very few decision points to make at the beginning, um, but it becomes a much different game for them when they're actually applying it to the tabletop versus George is sitting there racking his brain over what models to pick into sp specific matchups. Um, and it, as we've talked about already, that like feeds into like mental load over the long terms of a tournament. Um, and it'll be interesting, George, as you play Brood Brothers going into Nova, because we'll be doing like what seven rounds over the course of two days or something like that. How that's gonna play into your one how you how well you do and to like you know, if you dedicating yourself to this team, finding out what those correct choices are will reward you or not. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, puzzle that I am quite enjoying trying to figure out what, uh, which options on my leader or assets, or even if I take no leader uh, and take Gribblies, because I've taken just, you know, I played a game of loot to Salvagers on open board where I took the Familiars, I took Lookout, and I took a just a Trooper. No Primus, no Patriarch, no Magus, and I absolutely demolished that game. I won by like nine points or something. It's it just more bodies on loot is a good idea. Who knew? I want to get a little bit more into that idea of choice. Specifically, you were talking about how you thought that you were going to run or that you would have preferred to run one of those two other sort of brood coven loadouts where you're either taking the patriarch or uh, you're taking a bunch of little, you know, little throwaway dudes for uh, this matchup against VetGuard. So can you talk a little bit more about sort of the thought process behind why you would pick one of those two against VetGuard? Yeah, so on I'm learning uh, after playing two games on Into the Dark as Brood Brothers, I'm learning that the team you're playing into has a secondary effect on your choices uh, on Into the Dark than the map you were playing specifically. So uh, we played Bridge, which is the large open room in the center, and then it has a, a, another smaller room on the right side of your deployment zone. So whether you're red or blue, it's got a room right up against your deployment zone on your right. So that means that on your left, there's just a big empty space with your opponent's room up there. Uh, and so I committed the Primus and the Veteran over there, and I did not respect that he committed the demo to assaulting that room where I committed my demo man to assaulting his room. He just didn't feed anyone into the room. And so it didn't matter. 
So was it a situation where like he had his demo like up against the door uh, and then you had like you just gave him an extra APL to, you know, like move plant detonate on turn two? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's just he set it up perfectly. He did everything textbook and I just I fell for it hook, line and sinker. Uh, Another one of my big mistakes was I took the faction tack op to do mission actions um, to prepare prepare for ascension or whatever it's called. I figure on capture, eh, sure, it's probably fine to spend a mission action. But on Into the Dark, that means you have to open doors and commit more models. And that was a mistake that allowed him to pick up the veteran and Primus instead of just one of them. Uh, If I was smarter and chose better attack ops, I wouldn't have had to commit that hard to those models. That's certainly a tough, like a tough choice on that particular map because you have to get four objectives prepared uh, in order to get the first VP, right? Yeah, it was it was a wrong choice. It was just a mistake. Uh, it was bad. That's very <laughs> very similar to my game where like I felt really good about my choices as Gellerpox on that map, but obviously you know taking tech infection is going to be like you're going to do it pretty much every time, but it's just going to be a little bit harder to score on that map because you've really just got to push up and get into probably one of the side rooms in order to do it. Yeah, yeah. And that's where I failed spectacularly, is I didn't commit hard enough on either flank or the center, and so I just lost everywhere. Um, and Vetguard have more bodies than Brood Bros, even if we have the same number of activations, so he was able to leverage his ability to just take bullets and th- apparently survive them to just push up the board. Uh, so like I made a number of mistakes in that game and I lost quite deservedly, uh, that game. I got absolutely smashed, uh, but in doing so I learned so much about, so if I had taken the patriarch, I would have committed the patriarch to my left side. So he would be the one going up and staging to capture my opponent's room. And that's all I would need on that side, right? And so I would basically take everyone else and commit it to the center while leaving just one person on my right side for them to just get absolutely annihilated by the demo mine. Because that's the that's where the demo mine's going to come from. It's just the best place to put it. And because the Patriarch has two activations, you can easily set it up to, you know, dash him up with a scout dash, move with one APL, and then... Uh, you just keep them on engage. It's a shut door and your opponent moves up there and opens the door. They're just going to get eaten by the Patriarch or if they move up, you activate with three APL, you open the door, you charge in, you eat something. So like he's so dangerous on into the dark where he is not really that dangerous on, I mean, he's still, he's still very dangerous on open. He's just a lot less dangerous on open. And because I've only played open, I didn't have that thought process. I'm I'm real low on the Patriarch on open currently. I was just going to say, I do. I was just thinking through it. Like one of the big limiting things on the Patriarch, right, is that he can't move more than nine inches in an activation. So like that recon dash is just so huge for him. And then yeah. if you're doing that on one of these maps like Bridge, that's like, you know, the shorter distance to your opponent's deployment zone, you can actually like wreak a lot of havoc if you really wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a huge threat range. And if they don't respect your threat range, then, you know, if you get real aggressive with them, you could, uh, you know, pop open the door, go from engage to conceal, because he has an action that lets him flip his order. So open door, flip his order, just move on to the point. You're four APL. Did they commit two dudes to it? Great. Did they not commit two dudes to it? Great. Right? That's just brutal. Like, (laughs) this is... Yeah, it's the um it's the towns of the emperor problem, right? It's they're much worse on open and they're much better on into the dark cuz they don't have to worry about getting shot so easily on turning point 1. You're able to set up the patriarch in a position to wreak havoc and be relatively safe turning point 1. Yeah. yeah. And I should have dropped the plasma gun for my flamer. Just cuz on an into the dark type map where you're less likely to get a bunch of lookout tokens even with lookout up Like, the only thing it shot at, because Nick, again, good player, he didn't give me any shots that wasn't, I move and shoot you first, or I move and charged and fought you and killed you. So he didn't give me any shots on anyone who was important uh, to his plan. Uh, And then 
by the time I did get to fire the plasma gun, it was turn three, and I rolled two ones and a two. And it's just like, all right, well, I miss, and I'm on one wound. So that was great. Uh, but, like, if I grabbed a flamer, I mean, it still would have been the worst roll I've ever seen for a flamer. But I had an extra dice, and, you know, there was two hits still. Yeah, I, you know, painted up a flamer for my bows, mostly as, like, a test model. But also, you know, I, I just like flamers. And coming from someone who played Vet Guard, I think that there is a lot of flamer play out there. Especially, like, if you're going into, like you know, Brood Bros versus Vet Guard or like a Brood Bro mirror match. I think that's going to be just like a really useful operative because, you know, there's a pretty good chance that they're just not going to roll enough fives and sixes to live. Yeah. And statistically, uh, I was proven wrong in this particular game, but statistically, yeah. And it gives you the opportunity to hit more dudes on Into the Dark, which you're more likely to hit more dudes on Into the Dark just because there's so many, so many places they can be. I mean, for me, I don't think it's really ever worth it to take a flamer unless you're Warp Coven. I mean, I think the whole thing with, like, the plasma, right, because you're hitting on fours, is that theoretically against a big target or against any target, you, you can fire and forget the plasma, and most times you're you're just going to kill whatever you're shooting at, versus the flamer is maybe uh, you would need four hits to kill anything on seven wounds and assume they make no saves. Um, though I guess the theory behind using plasma with this team is setting up crossfire tokens, but against guardsmen that doesn't really work because they die to a stiff breeze. So I, I can understand why you would feel that way, but I do still think that the plasma was, is always the right choice. Um, yeah. If you have the ability to, to take so one. from Coming from Vedguard, where you have a plasma that can reroll, that gets ceaseless. So you always go hot because you have ceaseless. It's still hitting on fours, though, and fours is just too swingy. If your game is going really well as Brood Bros, whatever you're firing the plasma at probably has one or two crossfire tokens on it. So having two rerolls just in your pocket makes a four-up plasma way scarier. But if you have to fire the thing at someone with no crossfire tokens, now you're just firing a four-up gun that if you roll a one, you, you hurt yourself. It's not that great. And on Into the Dark, a flamer getting lethal five up, being able to hurt a bunch of people that have just pushed up into your deployment, your territory, gives it a much broader appeal, uh, especially against a horde team. If it was, you know, a legionary or whatever, nah, not a chance. Leave the flamer at home, take the plasma. Uh, but I don't necessarily want a flamer to kill a bunch of models at once. Although it has absolutely just annihilated, uh, like, commandos and stuff. Uh, I've got it in. So, like, it can wipe a good portion of a room if the your opponent positions poorly. But it forces that positioning game where if they want to get big gains in a room, you can force them into a position where they're going to have to eat big damage in return. Okay, I can understand that. I still, I still think just firing a plasma is always just going to be better. Because if I'm firing a gun, I'm doing it with the intention of killing a target because there's a reason I'm trying to kill that sure. target. Sure, but if there's, uh, because if there's four vet guard in the room and there's zero of you in the room, one plasma is not going to change the board state there. I mean, it's what? It's, tor it's torrent two torrent or two. torrent one? Yeah. It's respectable. I mean, for me, I probably wouldn't take the flamer unless it was either an eight wound or less model or a five up save. And really, like into the dark, going to see a lot of play there. Not as much on open board. Yeah, you don't take it on open board. There's literally zero reason to take it on open board, even against horde teams. Like I took the flamer in my ITD game against salvagers who are eight wounds, three up save, and like I know I took two full health salvagers down to two wounds and was. Really chuffed about that. I thought that was fantastic. Uh, but yeah, so I made a bunch of mistakes. In summary, I made a bunch of mistakes. I, I, it took me like nine hours to like, what happened to that game? Because I just got absolutely demolished. So I had to get over the, do I suck at this game actually? Into the, <laughs> okay, okay. I don't suck. I just made mistakes. What are the mistakes I made? So side point before we get into Mark's game, that feeling. That is something, I don't know about y'all, there are some games, for me, where I have that thought quite often, and I think 
to all the new players out there, I want to say, if you get crushed in a game, do not go, I suck at this game immediately. Please do what George did instead and actually think about what happened. And I promise you, you're going to discover about 15 different things that you did wrong and you will actually learn something. That is much more useful ways of actually getting better at this game if you care about that than blaming dice, than blaming a meta, than blaming whatever. Now, I have a giant ass caveat onto this. There are some teams right now that have very, very, very good matchups into other teams. I say this as an elite player. If you have 10 or more bodies, you're already playing with a leg down. Give me a leg up. I think you're crossing your idioms. Sorry, let me, let me, let me. You are elite <laughs> team. You not have six, you have more than 10 bodies. You doing good against elites. There you go. That's what I'm saying. Uh, is they're going to out activate you. And that's just something you're going to have to deal with and learn to live with that. That's an edge case. But if you're playing a 10 body team, yes, sometimes you're going to get out activated and that, that does matter, but it matters less where skill comes into play in that instance versus when you're playing an elite team. So just keep that in mind, especially if you're new at this game, that tilting doesn't help anyone. It just makes you upset and want to quit a game that you actually enjoyed it, enjoyed potentially at one point. Uh, and we don't want that. We like more people playing kill team. So just a PSA there. Yeah. The two things I would add to that, Joe, one is like when you're a newer player, the other thing to remember is that it's a very, very steep learning curve for kill team. There's a lot of rules and there's a lot of factions that have a lot of rules within themselves. So if you're losing games after like just getting started, it's not your fault. There's just a ton of stuff that you kind of have to learn along the way. And the other thing is just the idea of I have bad games all the time. And when that happens to me, my mind frame is never I suck at this game. It's I had a bad game. And I think that that's probably the first step to sort of getting on the path of learning something from it as opposed to sort of wallowing in it. I cannot tell you the amount of people I've seen in our league lose every single game in the league and then come back the next league and do a thousand times better, win half their games, win more than half their games. There is a learning curve that is always going to be applied to this game. And if you put the time, you're going to get rewarded for that time. And if that's something that you care about, you're going to see yourself improve. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yep. And that's the fun part about it. In my opinion, it's the best part of this game is knowing the functionality of your models and the, how that applies to the rules to have your opponent go, wow, I didn't see that. Right. Or they catching your opponent off guard in that way because you put in the time, because you put in the effort. Yeah, it's the thing that I understand the most about people who enjoy fighting games. There's so much depth yep. in a fighting game. You simply do not see unless you're part of that world. And it's the same thing with Kill Team. Like you can watch a game at Kill Team, but unless you're part of the understanding of how the game works, it a lot of it just goes over your head. And also sometimes, yeah, you're going to get caught on a rule that seems stupid or somebody's going to hide behind the edge of a curve on an Octarius terrain and you're going to go, why can't I shoot them? And then your opponent's going to go, nan, nan, boo, boo. My edge is right behind yeah, this boo, edge. Boo. And you're just going to have to, and you're just going to have to deal with that because that's how this game works. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> that's, uh, it's definitely got me thinking now about like, what is the neutral game of kill team? Uh, but that's probably... Yeah. Another topic for another. Yeah, we episode. should do that as a topic because I think about Kill Team like a fighting game. We should. Uh, but yeah, so that was pretty much my game. So, uh, Mark, you want to go over your game? I do. And as we're kicking that off for my game, I want to ask you a question, George. So I played against Day, who is a fantastic player in our league. The matchup was my Gellerpox versus her Hunter Clade. And she was really excited because she said she had a really good strategy before the game and she pulled you to the side to tell you what it was. And I wanted to ask her after the game, but we finished at like 11 p.m. I was pretty fried. Uh, so I wanted to hear from you. Uh, do, did she tell you what the strategy was that oh, she was yeah. approaching the game with? Yeah, it was uh, run away from you. Yes, and <laughs> she did that and it did work very well. Yeah. Uh, so... First thing I wanted to point out was I think she did a fantastic job with roster selection. Um, she ran five Rust Stalkers and five Vanguard, and it's just a really tough combination to go up against. Because, um, 
Gilder Pox because Rust Stalkers are nasty. And if you get a little too close to a Vanguard in the process, that Rust Stalker is probably going to ruin your day. Yeah, it's uh, one of the things that Day has, because she bounces ideas off me um, to try and get better Hunter Clade. And like, I've played Hunter Clade for a little bit. I understand the team, but she finds things that I, I look at and go, oh man, that's really good. Like, she absolutely, I played a game against her as Kazakin into her Hunter Clade. Uh, and I did a really good job of just shooting her Sicarians. And then she just moved up the the Vanguard and was just like, all right, I'm just going to charge you with Vanguard. And like, well, no, no, nothing's going to happen. We're both four dice. I'm on fives now because I'm injured. You're on fours. We're both two, three damage. Like, what are we doing here? <laughs> it was a great play. Yeah, I mean, a pretty similar thing happened in my game, obviously, where the Vanguard were just going up against the Rust Emanations from the Nightmare Hulks. So it was just a lot of grossness and injury everywhere. It's a nuclear, it's a nuclear Nurgle soup. Yes, to, to put it politely. And it worked out well because her uh, models are painted with like glow in the dark paint and she's got like slime or like radioactive sludge on the base. So they're, you know, radioactive, just like my dudes. They're just, um, they're gorgeous models. They are fantastic. Uh, Zach, he came by the table and said that we had the best painted matchup of the week. And that, you know, that uh, got, me, got me going there a little bit. Yeah, I believe it. I ran what I felt like was a pretty standard setup. I will say that it was my first time going for a bigger skew towards sludge grubs on ITD. In the past, I've kind of just splashed into one and then gone for some more flying bugs. But I've heard that going for a lot of sludge grubs is really good on ITD, obviously with the lethal five and the mortals from splash, really good stuff. And I've had that like kind of damage spike where you're rolling like two crits and a hit and all of a sudden someone just dies to a sludge grub. It was it's behind so a door. good. It's so good. Yeah. I love doing that. It's really cool. Um, my dice were not rolling particularly well, so I didn't get a lot of value out of the sludge grub. But let's see, what are some other important things? Did you before? get any yeah. value out of them exploding? Um, I dealt two mortals to two operatives at the end of the game who I wasn't going to be able to kill anyway. That's unfortunate. But yeah, one of the nice things about the sludge grubs is that when they die, they explode and hurt people. Mm -hmm. It is really nice. And your hulks can do that too, as well as your other operatives if you want to spend command points on them, which is not a very popular way to spend command points. But I've actually killed some operatives by dealing like an extra mortal or two after fighting with a hulk. And that's really nice. You know, it's good to get people off the board. Yeah. I've lost operatives to Orion's gather box by killing a hulk. And he's like, all right, now I blow him up and you die. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, great. Thanks for souring that accomplishment. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mentioned this during your recap. Um, I did take tech infection and it was, you know, it's the best faction tech up they've got, in my opinion. And it's really easy to score, but that's a particularly tough map to score it on. My game plan going into it was, OK, I need to try and get one of these two sort of side rooms where I can, you know, really sort of assert myself and get a get somebody onto the the point and do the mission action, probably turning point two or three, depending. So I deployed with my Lumbergast kind of in the middle room. I did the Flesh Screamer to that one room off to the right-hand side. You have to enter from your deployment zone. I did Vulgar and the Bloat Spawn on the left-hand side in that kind of open area. And I managed to do what I think was like a pretty dynamic play in the sense where I really was committing Vulgar to that room on the left-hand side, but I held the bloat spawn back a little bit so that if I needed to, he could make a play in the center room, which ended up paying off pretty inactive turn one for both of us, but we both got three on primary. I got my first point on tech infection because on capture with three points right there, it's just pretty easy to do. Day got a point on recover item. And when she won initiative in the second turning point, like you said, George, she took that item and ran away and it worked. She scored the second point pretty easily. One thing that I was really hoping to get like initiative in that point, because I had sort of seen this opportunity. I didn't use draw the hum, call the hum in the first turning point because I didn't see much of a need to, but if I could have gotten 
initiative, I could have just kind of scooted my Lumbergast out from behind the heavy cover where he was hiding and then gotten like a really nice clean charge onto a couple operatives. But I ended up just getting uh, one of the plasma gunners, or I don't know which of the two big nasty gunners I got, but I, I did effectively one shot it with the Lumbergast with my activation. And the rest of the game or the rest of that turning point ended up just being like, try to kill the Hulk. She sank a bunch of stuff into killing the Hulk and she did. And the Hulk blew up. And at that point there was just a rust stalker on a couple wounds, just kind of hanging out. And I ran the, uh, bloat spawn up and finished the job there too. So another point on a good thing, if you're a hunter clay playing against a Geller Pox is that, uh, I guess calculated eradication is the name of the faction tack up the one where it's like, kill more wounds than you i've just got so many wounds to kill and it seems like a really really easy to score attack up against yeah uh, there's so many wounds uh and like hulks can take 18 damage and you can't do more than seven to a skatari or more than 10 to uh a sicarian so yeah it seems seems pretty legit and to do it geller box yeah yeah, I mean, I killed a uh, Rust Stalker and um, a Vanguard operative, that gunner, uh, in the second turning point, and it was still like 24 wounds to seven or to 17, and kind of a hard hill to climb there. She actually had a one point lead coming out of that turning point. The things that I remember about the third turning point is that there was a couple unlucky moments. Um, for day one in particular, I did end up pushing into that left room with Volgrar and getting some backup over there. He scored Robin Ransack, scored me some points, and then Day was about to fire on him with her other gunner. She rolled the dice, and then she's like, Oh, I forgot to say if I was going to roll hot or not. Do you mind if I just re roll and go hot? And I'm like, Yeah, totally, that's fine. And she re rolled four hits into a hit, a crit, and two ones. Yeah, Rob. And yeah, that's really rough, and that might have swung the game in her favor if she hadn't done that. But ultimately, the thing I think is that sort of runaway strategy allowed me to be on five objectives at the end of turning point three, and that was the sort of swing moment in the game was just going four one. Yeah. Question on question on that particular move. How do you remember how much she, CP she had at that point? Uh, not very many. I think she actually, I think, had to use her last CP um, to get that shot off. I think she used her last CP to switch her imperative to get the extra inch of movement to take that shot. Oh, interesting. Okay, because I was going to say I'm shocked she didn't switch the imperative to get the balance reroll. Right. I mean, yeah, I think I think that was still a, v a valid way of doing that just to try and get that shot. In the hope that like four four hits go through, going hot, you don't roll anything, and like you roll particularly poorly on your your feel no pain, mm -hmm. it's it's something I would do. It's just as a hail mary. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that it was like a bad idea, and that seems like a pretty fair way to do it. You know, that's what I've done in the past when I've been you know trigger happy and haven't declared how I'm firing my weapon is just do it over again, right? As long yeah. as everybody agrees to that. Yeah, real stand up over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and. <clears throat> I mean, I think that was really it at that point. I took what, to me, apart from uh, tech infection, felt like pretty standard tech ops route, uh, Robin Ransack, and I ended up maxing all three. It was 18-15, really, really tight competitive game. I think a couple things that from my play really stood out as mistakes and things I needed to do better was target selection. Uh, there was multiple points where I was fighting a Rust Stalker when I shouldn't be or doing fights that I didn't need to. I remember in the third turning point, I ended up pushing into that room on the right-hand side with my Flesh Screamer, and I charged into a Rust Stalker and Vanguard Operative. I think it was her leader, actually, her Vanguard leader and a Rust Stalker. And I fought the Rust Stalker, and I was going to fight twice. I fought the Rust Stalker first because he hadn't activated, and that's just sort of one of those mental heuristics, those shortcuts where I'm like, oh, I want to kill the Operative who hasn't activated cut things short but that was a terrible idea because i was injured and so i rolled one successful hit actually i yeah i rolled one hit and then with blessings of infection i got a flip one to a hit uh so i hit once and then this rust stalker with rending had three crits 
uh, and two hits. So <laughs> it just dealt a shit ton of damage. I think it took me down to four or five wounds. Just And I was like, well, I'm not going to fight twice now. I kind of screwed myself there. So that was a huge mistake. And obviously, you know, that's just something I, I had thought about that before the game. It's like, you know, got to kill the Vanguard operatives. But in the moment, I was... I, it was the wrong choice because I was using sort of the wrong mental process to get to it. I was using one of those shortcuts and not one of those things that I had sort of thought about specifically in that matchup. Yeah. Yeah, I think the biggest, why Geller Pox is so strong on Into the Dark is because for a lot of teams, the best strategy into Geller Pox is run away from the big scary guys and try and kill the little guys. And on Into the Dark, there's not there's just not the room to do that. There's, if you want to get past the big hulks, there's no way to just go around a piece of terrain or, you know, try and block them with, with terrain in some way. There's there's these doors that they can just stand next to and block your way. Uh, and so, while I think it is a good strategy to run away from you, that strategy only kind of works for, like, two turns tops. Uh, and then you just sort of need to, like, turn on the aggression uh, and, like, yeah, if you're going to go hard into Rust Stalkers... You really pair them up with a vanguard just so you, you know, you get a, a vanguard in within two inches of a hulk, you charge that rust stalker in, now the hulk is injured, it's going to get maybe two hits with blessings up, you parry one away, and then you just hit it hard. Yeah, absolutely. And that was, I remember on the left hand side where I pushed Volgar up, uh, he ran into a rust stalker who effectively did nothing the whole game. It ran into that room and then it kind of tucked up against the door and then you know, that was that. On the left-hand side, nobody charged into that room on my side, um, on my right-hand side, until turning point four. Like, it, basically, it was just like a stand, like a standoff where my Hulk was just staring at a Rust Stalker and just nobody wanted to do anything. <laughs> yeah. Um, another tactical error was in the final turning point, I did win initiative turning point four, and I got my bloat spawn into a group of two vanguard and i fought once against i think it was the diktat and at that point i think i went into that fight with five wounds left because he was just kind of standing out in the open in that middle room at the end of the turning point so charged up kill the diktat and i'm like oh i'm gonna fight twice kill the leader uh i was injured so of course i didn't roll very well and then the leader just killed me and that was just a, a misplay. Obviously, I had a lead at that point uh, from all the points I scored in turning point three, and the right play would have been to leave the blow spawn there to either like waste an activation from the leader to kill it, or potentially just the, try to fall back and hopefully that gets eaten up. But you know, small mistake there. Um, I like to think that if it wasn't a little bit later in the evening, I might have been a little bit sharper. Maybe that's, you know, making an excuse, but I think that my brain power just like falls off super hard after 10 o'clock. And <laughs> it is, it's bedtime for a lot of people. It is. I I'm old now. So I just wake up at the same time every day. And so it's just, I go to bed earlier and earlier. Sun downing in your late twenties. Classic. Yeah. I mean, Hey, I'm, I'm 30, bro. I'm 32. Yeah. Oh Jesus! We, you're, I didn't know you were older than me. That's I thought wild. we had this conversation. Did we? You know, no. I'm. It was sundown. on my birthday. Jesus. We played kill team on my birthday. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. So that's that's wild. Okay. Well, I'm going to be 30 in less than a year. We'll play oh, kill team dude. on your birthday too. Yeah. Get ready for all the aches and pains. They just sort of show up. So I guess to summarize, the things I learned from my game is really not. Try, like obviously you want to have these mental shortcuts, but to try and bounce those as well as you can with the things that you know you need to do against either a certain opponent due to their play style or a certain team due to their strengths and weaknesses, as well as, you know, um, play Geller Pox on Into the Dark, I guess. You know, <laughs> I, it's it's a good pick. It's a good pick. It's a good pick. And one thing that I want to do differently is I've basically been deploying my groups the same way every time where I'm kind of like splitting everybody up, like do like a mutant to uh, glitchlings and some bugs and then to do the same kind of group and then deploy my big guys last. I like deploying the big guys last. It's great. But uh, I think for something like Into the Dark, I'd like to start maybe deploying all my mutants in a group together. And that way, I don't have them so spread out if I want to do, like, some sort of, like, carpet bombing tactic. 
Yeah, I, and Into the Dark, I like deploying the three mutants, Volgrar and the Sludge Grub last, just because they have frag grenades, the Flamer, and the Splash, so that you can use them to... If you're if you're the defender, you can use them to project a bunch of area denial threat, or if you're the attacker, you can use them, that group, to be like, okay, where's the greatest concentration of opponents over there? What is my best way to push up and hit a bunch of them with the, you know, one of these frag grenades or Volgrar, uh, and then, like, make that work? Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense, too, since a lot of the Into the Dark maps, especially, are kind of, like, split into thirds. And so you're probably going to go with, like, a Hulk in each room plus a, one more Hulk on a certain point. Yeah. It's interesting playing Gatherbox on Into the Dark versus Open. You just have to think about very different things. Uh, well, speaking about thinking of different things, let's think about Joe's game. Uh, Joe, tell us a little bit about what went down for you this week. All right, week three, still on Nemclaw, uh, went into good old Chris, uh, great player with his commandos, uh, same map as everyone else. Going into this one, I was feeling pretty all right. You know, Nemesis Claw, Under the Dark, is going to be really strong in the same way that Legionnaire is. Uh, obviously, you got to be a little more defensive with them since they're not as, like, physically tough as Legionnaires are. But as Legionnaire had the advantage against commandos on Into the Dark, so does Nemesis Claw. The primary differences in uh, strengths for Nemesis Claw, uh, they have more reliable rerolls, uh, and arguably their fighting is just better in certain ways. Um, for example, uh, the Screecher by itself is a nightmare for Commandos to deal with, especially if you throw skin on him. Uh, that means he's turning all of his boys into hitting on fours with no rerolls, which very often will lead to situations, especially if you... Uh, took the mortal wounds on the first charge, uh, where you're just two tapping orcs with two crits and there is no just scratch to be found, uh, which is uh, sort of what happened in my game. So this map is notoriously bad for elites. I've found success on it, and I've found failure on it, and I feel like I kind of took that experience uh, and applied it in this game. Uh, I only put one legionnaire on the far left. And he literally held that down the entire game. Or, what, sorry, one Nemesis Claw operative. See where my brain's at. The Heavy Bolter, um, which in hindsight might have not been the choice. I kind of regretted not having the Fearmonger personally because it would have been able to poison the objective and make certain rolls against me easier to deal with. So, for example, he put the Daka Boy, the bomb squig and the knife guy on that side with the one guy um and capture is really annoying because that first turning point you got to stick a guy on it if you want to score the point so i didn't even bother to go score three points in the first turning point i went ended up going two three i believe um and then going to the second turning point i lost initiative which really sucked i mean he gave initiative to me so obviously i was probably going to lose it but I set up the Ventrilocar in the middle with the Skin Thief. And then I had the uh, Screecher and my leader on the far right. Just to kind of keep that three-inch bubble of no rerolls and the Grizzly Trophy online. To make those two a little tougher. Uh, he put the Commando Knob and a Boy on the right side. So I figured I could fairly easily kind of, uh, to use an orc term, crump them. Uh, and that's kind of what happened. So basically, I advanced my leader uh, onto the point. I put the Screecher right up to the door. I had my Heavy Bolter kind of tucked in the back, ready for the going to second turning point. I had the Ventrilo car uh, and the Skin, th the skin Thief uh, both ready to go, and I kept the Melta in off the, the middle point on the right, um, and I basically flip-flopped them. So... Uh, I had the Heavy Bolter hold on that left side. I had the Skin Thief come all the way to the right. And then I had the uh, Melta Gun actually come all the way through the other door on the right side to set up to deny him the stalk target, I believe it is, for infiltration. The one you have to be within three inches of the guy. Um, and so I kind of knew that I was going to be going down on points, turning point one and probably turning point two. So I just took, I took Robin Ransack. Um, I took... Um, Dread Tail, Dark Rumor, the faction tack up, which is, I have mixed opinions on it because 
I was a little too efficient at killing at the end, and we'll get there. Um, and it led me to make a very awkward play, which I'm not exactly feeling great about. Uh, but whatever. Uh, I took that, and then I took Route. Um, I think the faction tack ups were good picks. I do think maybe I could have thrown Executioner in there, maybe Headhunter, because I ended up killing uh, the Commando Knob you know, his second turning point, which there's no way to predict that I could have done that because obviously we hadn't deployed at that point. Um, but basically going turning point two, I lost. Uh, first thing he does on the right side with the Screecher and my leader is he opens the door and fights the Screecher. And I'm like, fantastic. Just feed him into me. And it went about as well for Chris as you would have thought it would have. Listen, uh, I, believe he I fought a Screecher with a Patriarch and I did six damage and ended that fight with six wounds remaining. I know how badly that fight can go. Yeah, so he basically got one hit on me and then I just killed him. Uh, to which I was like, fantastic, awesome. Uh, no, sorry, I got him to one wound. So we were locked in combat. Um, I, instead of taking that play, and I didn't, I held Vox Scream until the moment that I needed it, and it's, it's actually probably what won me the game. So, I also use Prussian tokens here pretty effectively. Um, I rolled two during the first turning point, and kind of staggered out to some of those activations. Like, I rolled a decent amount of Prussians. I think I rolled three in the second turning point. Uh, that Those were much more effective, uh, in my opinion, than the first turning point. So... He goes, then I take my Ventrilo car, and I immediately charge into, I believe, which operative was this? I forget which operative it was. I believe it might have been another boy. Uh, killed, uh, I got the uh, mortal wounds. Uh, got him on nine wounds. Got a crit and a normal. That's all I needed. Um, or no, I might actually gotten two crits there, because he would have used just a scratch. I believe I got two crits there. Killed him, and then I used the ploy to charge into his uh, rocket boy. And killed him too. Uh, so that I got a double play right off the rip. And I'm feeling real good about myself. And that is when he took the the commando knob. And then he went and killed the Screecher. Because um, the Screecher... <laughs> just, just walk up like, this fight's taking too long, Blat. <laughs> yeah, no, because he, he, I, I, he had gotten him... To, I, I'm misremembering. He had gotten him to seven wounds. And he had the power claw. And he just got lucky enough to roll a crit, yep. which wh whatever I it happened. I actually, threes, it's pretty high likelihood of a six in there. Well, remember he was hitting on fours because of the with no rerolls because of the creature. Uh, he's looking for sixes so anyway. It, I know, but that could have gone a lot worse for him. So I thought that was a little questionable. I know he technically only needed a crit, but I'm like, that could have gone way worse for you, and that could have been a very bad two for one. You ain't wrong. You ain't wrong. Um, but I'm like, okay, cool. And I actually think the big chopper might be the call into Nemesis Claw. Purely because of that operative, and you really want to hit the on twos, and they don't have any damage reduction. So yeah, I mean, when I was running commandos, I took Big Choppa into pretty much every team, except for maybe like Vet Guard. I would take the claw into Space Marines because the ability to crit hit two tap a Space Marine is very valuable, especially with um, Wa, which I believe uh, gives, Wah, yeah. gives you a crit, right? Yeah, I don't. Rem I believe he did have it up at that point, and I think that's why. Pretty yeah, because I think if you get two hits, you turn one to a crit. Exactly. Uh, and you just basically just don't fight this creature with him. That's all you need to do. But that's the thing. That's the thing too. That's why I was saying I don't know if that was the move for him to go into me because you're now hitting on fours, dog. There's a good chance you get one hit and that's it. And you can't. Is the commando knob five attacks or four? He's four. He's four. He is four. Uh huh. Oh, hmm. Yeah. That's a bit sus. I'm glad it worked out for him, but that I don't know if I would have done that. Yeah, I mean, bear in mind, I was on seven wounds, so all he needed was a crit, but like that could have gone so much worse for him. And that's the other thing. I had the my leader right there with my plaza pistol, so literally all I did was I charged the, the normal guy, or I went and um, charged the normal guy, killed him, and then just shot with a plaza pistol, killed the knob. That's another. Now, if we're adding up operatives, I have lost one operative to his four. We're on the third activation. So, you know, it just kind of went from there. Um, the sniper, I believe, ended up killing my ventrilocar, and then which is fine. Whatever. I 
I, at the end of the day with Marines, if I'm trading two orcs for one Marine, I don't care. It's fine. I was scoring the points I needed because of Robin Ransack. And that's why I don't like anybody that says take to take recon for these guys, because you're it's just not what they're good at. They're good at killing things. And that's I've every time I've had like a like a two percent inkling to take recon, I've always taken seek and destroy and been completely fine. I actually don't think I've not I've very rarely not gotten five or lower on with this team because they're just so good at killing. Um and so my heavy bolter this so I actually I was real afraid of the bomb squig. Um I and I actually so. didn't realize I didn't realize I did the math. You're actually not likely to kill a space marine in one go with the bomb squig. Like you're actually very likely not going to. So, and I I didn't really well, listen, I I in the very early stages of this game when the only two teams that existed was Vet Guard and Commandos played Traitor Marines and I lost two Space Marines to one Bomb Squig. Well, I actually I did the math after the game cuz I was like, "Oh, how likely was it?" I think it's like a 40% chance or something. It might even be lower than that. Uh so either way, that was a big moment. He opened up the door with the knife guy. Uh, through the bomb squig into my uh, heavy bolter. He was survived on two wounds. So that scored me two more points because he was able to hold on that side more. Um, he he made another big mistake in turning point three it, because my space marine was on two wounds. He used the DACA boy instead of just running up and punching me in the face and killing me. Uh, so he used the DACA and he ended up whiffing on the DACA. So I shot him, uh, put him on, I want to say three wounds and then i charged and killed him so that now invest had forced him to invent the knife guy uh into killing him which he did um but by that point i had already gotten my skin thief back on the other side of the board um and at this point i had gotten my uh i, I was I, I was already so far on the right side that i knew i was going to get the um point i needed for dread uh dark tale dark rumor um i already scored my first point on route um going to third turning point i already knew that i had a real good setup because he took the um the grot and put him in pretty like close charging range so i, I knew I, that's where my crucial vox stream came in uh, i lost initiative into third turning point again uh and he had uh used that activation to kill my bolter uh i used that the next activation to deal uh with the let's see what was it i believe I forget which operative I dealt with, but either way, what ended up happening is he goes to activate the the uh, Gretchling or whatever the hell it is. Uh, I go Vox Scream, no. He does another guy. Uh, I take the Melta. I go the Melta snaps his neck, and then I Melta the uh, Sniper. So I ended up getting the point for route. Um, I ended up taking out another threat. Uh, he does another model. Activation after that. I kill a guy in melee with my leader, and then I uh, plasma pistol his comms. That's where I took my point on Robin Ransack. Um, and at that point, he had two guys left. Um, and this is where the issue with Dread Tail Dark Ruber came in, because I was like, oh, I need to be within six of an enemy operative, and he's on one guy. I actually cannot kill this guy. I have to let him stay alive. Uh, so going into fourth turning point, I win finally, and I charge him. I and I actually learned this from you, George. Um, you actually don't have to strike with uh, melee if you don't want to. So I basically got him down to one wound, and then I just parried the rest out and didn't do anything other wounds to him. And I'm like, cool. He's on one wound. What is he gonna do? He can't if he if he gets off the point. That's a point for me. He can't get more than four inches away from me because he's injured now. So I'm guaranteed to score the point on Dread Tell a Dark Rumor. Uh, and he, he doesn't have enough to get on the other point. So I ended up going on primary two, three, four, four. And then I maxed out. So that got me 19. And Chris went three, two, two, one, I believe. And it got, I want to say three on primary. Um, and it ended up being 13, 19. So kind of like big takeaways. Um, the mistake, the mistake I made, I, I want to say I moved too far up, but like, I wouldn't have scored the points if I didn't if I hadn't moved up. So it's like, how do you it's it's also part of the design for the map. There there literally I don't think is a way to dodge that bomb squig without losing. 
So I really think you just got to like just take the role and just hope it works out. Even if that's the case, it would have been a three point, a two point swing his direction with me minus one point. So I still would have won by about three or four. So I don't necessarily think it would have mattered. But man, it's just on that map, it's so hard to dodge the bomb squig because you just keep him just enough distance out and you keep a guy, another orc between you and the bomb squig. You're not going to be able to get to the bomb squig because you're going to be in engagement range to fight the other guy at the door. So you have to just kind of just hope it works out. And that's what I kind of figured out mid game. I'm like, well, let's see what happens. And I ended up surviving. Uh, MVP of the game was my leader. Uh, he killed one, two, three, four guys by himself. Plaza pistol on twos is good. Uh, is what I- excellent. In fact. Uh, so yeah. And we'll, we'll reliably kill orcs, especially since if you got three hits, uh, and they save one, theoretically just a scratch can come up but when you're hitting on twos you're very reliably hitting all four of them and therefore just a scratch doesn't matter for any of the models including the knob did chris bring any dynamite to the party he did he put it on the knob and i had already uh dealt with that <laughs> before it became a when threat. i was playing a lot of commandos last year my play style was not so much focused towards like the big you know forward deploy alpha strike I ended up playing a lot of games where I was really trying to stage a lot of threats up and take Daka 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 on turning point two. So that way my dynamite, all of, you know, all of my dynamite, my bomb squig, anything else, you know, like rocket boy, especially on into the dark, just much more reliable shooting at that point. And that sort of thing can really like help, especially if you like need the bomb squig to make a critical play. Yeah. The problem was the problem was the dynamite in that game is I was always within two inches of another one of his guys. So, and I was pretty much on conceal too. So he never really would have gotten a chance to throw the dynamite. Mm. He also just needed that APL to open the door too yeah. and, and deal with stuff. Yeah, dynamite's surprisingly difficult to use on Into the Dark unless you are, you know, face pressed up against the door already. Yeah, so, I mean, I mean, literally, I just, I did the whole elite rundown uh nonsense and i mean bear in mind that game had i rolled poorly in that game i would have lost that game the ploy with the the mortal wounds on the first charge is really good that's the thing too make sure you're char- when you do that ploy that you're charging the melee guys first so that way you get the most out of it and you could potentially uh not have to worry about rolling crits so like against orcs if you roll two mortals you could two tap them with the entire team's melee. Um, it could also force out just a scratch, and that's kind of what you want to do: is force out like a just a scratch where they really don't want to use it. Yeah, that's how I beat Chris last league with Felgor. Is I committed nothing to fight him until I got uh, the flux spray up, and I hit like four dudes with uh, the mortal. the running past yeah. mortals. I hit like two or three dudes with a vandal twice. I got the flux spray off twice. So like nobody was on full wounds on the team when I charged when I charged into them. Uh and so like once the just a scratch was popped, I charged in and just fought. Uh and so like if you can force just a scratch on a commandos team and you have the ability to then get very aggressive on your opponent, that is the time you get very aggressive on your opponent. Yeah. Um like I said, it's um, I don't think this is an easy matchup for Nemesis Claw by any stretch. Um, or commandos are still commandos. Um, I still think they're one of the best teams in the game, um, if not in that top echelon, uh, by a good player. And Chris certainly proved that. Uh, I was sweating the whole time, even though he thought I had it pretty handily the whole time. Uh, I I knew deep in my heart that one bad dice roll probably would have swung it the other direction, as is with most things with uh, elite teams that don't necessarily have reliable access to elite to rerolls also i really need to get better at like using to uh the leader to get that command point reliably i haven't been doing that with his portent thing uh and it's really fucked me when i really want that extra cp i think that's just a really hard thing to do it though, is he, though he's he's a space marine leader on a space marine team and you need those guys to get stuff done because they hit on twos and they have a plasma pistol uh, three, you know, three APL of your eight. They have one, literally a six of your APL. Uh, so like, the only time I find that to be incredibly useful is if I am 
keeping him in my back line, and he's effectively doing nothing at all with it. So, like, turn one, I'll use it. Uh, or if I have literally nothing better to do with him because, like, I broke that flank and he just can't get anywhere. But at that point, I also don't need it. Uh, but uh, thank you, both of you, for uh, joining me this uh, this Friday Eve and talking about uh, the League and stuff. Uh, I know in the couple of coming weeks, we're going to talk about um, the League as a whole, because uh, we do keep... Uh, we have... The League organizer is uh, kind of an amazing person, and he keeps a bunch of stats on the League, uh, like what teams are doing well, uh, the what ta archetypes are doing well, uh, even stuff like who is winning games based on what their initiative roles are, mm. stuff like that. He's keeping amazing statistics, uh, and we're going to try and get him on and just talk about the stats. And uh, uh, so, not to brag, at the top of that EOL that we track. <laughs> oh, yeah, we also have a local ELO, ELO tracker. Feels good to be the king. <laughs> well, yeah, you've got a ways to go if you want to beat out um, Warp Coven for the top faction ELO, though. Is it? Yeah. Isn't that funny? Isn't that really, really funny? That literally Scott's pure dedication to that team is what got him there. You got to respect that. Look, belligerence pays off. Scott is nothing but belligerent. Yeah. 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 Oh, cool. <laughs> in, in the most endearing way possible. Agreed. <laughs> no, we love you, Scott. <laughs> uh, but anyways, yeah. Uh, great talking with you all. Uh, can't wait to talk about next week. And gentlemen... We are almost less than a month from Nova. Yeah. It's going to be a good time. Yeah. Hell awesome. yes. All right, you guys have a good night. Yeah. yeah. Till next time. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Vox Screen. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon, YouTube, or anywhere else you get your podcasts. Please follow, subscribe, and leave us a review. Any of those things are going to help us grow. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back soon with another episode.